Hey, everyone. Hey, Randy. How you doing, man? Good. How's everyone doing? Hi, Dr. Toms. Hello. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Well, we'll see how, how it works out. I just slap together some, some slides quick and then try to get out of the hour in time to get here today. So, Well, that's the way we like it. Fast and loose on Tumor Talk. Yep. <laughs> But um, I think we're just waiting on Jason. We'll get started. Sometimes he shows up a little late, but we can get started without him. We'll get started no at four o'clock sharp. No worries. And then I think at the end, um, the uh, Novacure people want about three minutes of time towards the end to okay. just give a little talk. So how much uh, time do you want me to go for? I've got about 25, 30 slides. You it's know, up to you. Typically what we do is about 15 to, you know, 15 to 20 minutes of presentation. Okay. And then we'll ask a few questions and kind of open it up to, you know, discussion. Okay. So I'll go through um, the slides relatively fast and sure. audience, you know, what's the kind of mix of demographics that you're getting for the audience? Oh, it ranges. We get nice, yeah, we got a nice, we have, uh, you know, a clinical audience. We have um, student audience. We've got mm -hmm. people from, yeah, from patients. The patients will come in. So it really runs the gamut. So. All right. So I'll keep it kind of a uh, medium level then and not try and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, make it too uh, too techy a talk. Jason, how yeah. are you? I'm well. Thanks for joining us. Sure, sure, sure. Hey, Jason. So we'll wait one hey. more minute and then we'll get started. Okay. Uh, you, somebody else, do the intros and then I'll uh, take over the screen and then ramble through the slides. Perfect. All right. Sounds like a plan. And we'll live stream this as well and then bank this bank this on the YouTube channel. So. You'll have the, the hits that you get today, as well as uh, uh, hopefully others to follow. As if I really monitor them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to. We do. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, well, that's good. Jay. That's good. Give me one sec. I'm going to pull up a slide real quick, an intro slide. Uh, yeah, I threw the intro slide on mine as well. Oh, you have it on yours? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah we, we built it in. Dr. Thompson. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it all at once then. So it's four o'clock. Why don't we get started? Um, welcome, everyone, to another edition of Tumor Talk. Uh, this is a joint collaboration between Lenox Hill Neurosurgery and the Journal of Neural Oncology, where we like to highlight uh, recently published articles in the Journal of Neural Oncology and kind of get discussion, you know, an open discussion with the author, as well as have uh, an interactive discussion with our participants. Um, as Dr. Sheehan was just mentioning, all these talks will be uh, both live streamed on Instagram and YouTube and then preserved there for posterity's sake. And you can share the, the conversation with whoever you like. Um, today, we're fortunate enough to have Stephen Toms with us, um, and we'll be discussing tumor treating fields and uh, a, a recent paper he published in the Journal of Neuro-Oncology. Today's uh, session is one of our special sessions. It's uh, sponsored in part by Novacure. And so we'd like to thank them for uh, contributing to uh, the NREF and the Journal of Neuro-Oncology as well. And so without further ado, uh, Dr. Toms, please enlighten us. Well, I'll do what I can to enlighten. Let's see how we uh, do this. We'll go to share screen here. See if we get there and go back to slideshow, maybe. And back to the top. All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, hopefully the audio visual will be uh, reasonable from my Mac here in the back of my office and everybody's staying safe during uh, COVID era here. Um, Today, uh, we'll be talking about a paper I did that was a post hoc analysis of the EF14 trial, which was a phase three trial looking at uh, Novacure tr tumor treating fields in addition to standard of care versus standard of care alone in the upfront treatment of glioblastoma. Uh, this work was done in combination with doctors. Kim and Nicholas, as well as Viram uh, from Israel. And I want to thank uh, Jason Sheehan from Journal of Neuro-Oncology, uh, Randy D'Amico and Natesh Patel for, for hosting. Uh, so as we said, we've been through this, so we'll move right along and I'll give a little bit of background for those uh, who aren't neurosurgeons in the field, that glioblastoma is the most common and prevalent adult uh, nervous system cancer. We see about 13,000 or so glioblastomas in the U.S. every given year out of about 23,000 gliomas. And there are some things that um, we as surgeons can impact, such as the age, the DNA methylation status, the mutational status of the tumor. But the one thing we can still impact as the barbarians in the field is to try and get you know, the uh, maximum extent of resection we can surgically. When we uh, do our very best and give our patients a uh, standard of care, which these days includes radiation about 54 to 60 gray and 
concomitant temozolomide, we get a median survival uh, of anywhere around 15, 16 months uh, for the glioblastoma. And again, the best survival depends on maximal surgical resection, temozolomide treatment, and obviously those who have a methylated MGMT tend to do much better in the order of five or six months survival better than those who are unmethylated. And we try and treat uh, radiation to the resection cavity plus a couple centimeter margin around the edema or infiltrating tumor that's seen on the T2 weighted MRIs. And with this, we get a median survival these days of about 14.6 you know, in Dr. Stroop's original paper in 2005, and now that median is pushed out to about 16 to 17 months in most studies. But glioblastoma has been a challenge I've worked on all my life, as well as Dr. Sheehan and many others uh, on this talk. One of the problems is that all the, the tumor that we see on MRI that lights up with gadolinium is fairly compact, and surgeons such as myself can take those out. There's a large amount of infiltrating tumor around the border. So surgery is effective at removing the compact tumor, but not the infiltrating tumor cells as they infiltrate into functional brain. Um, the blood-brain barrier keeps out many of the chemotherapies that we would like to deliver. Fractionated radiotherapy. And then if we really look carefully and something my lab's been working on for the last uh, eight or 10 years is that there's a subgroup of stem cells that can be epigenetically modified by the microenvironment and within those, a treatment resistant fraction of cells that really is mostly responsible for the migration and the poor outcomes we often see. So when we look at glioblastoma, we really have both regional uh, as well as systemic therapies that we can use and control. Among the local therapies that we have are those that we can do as surgeons with surgical resection. Radiation therapy is essentially a regional uh, therapy whether it's given in traditional fractions as image modulated radiotherapy or with stereotactic radiosurgery. And then we'll talk a little bit today about another uh, local regional therapy called tumor treating fields. Systemically, our, our systemic treatment is uh, primarily worked on chemotherapy. Unfortunately, our chemotherapies have only been marginally effective. Immunotherapy and immune targeted therapies have shown a lot of promise in a number of cancers. Uh, but glioblastoma thus far has been quite resistant and unless or until we get further with our uh, dendritic cell vaccines, some of our other immunotherapies, whether they be virally mediated or CAR T cell, we still don't have very good systemic therapies for glioblastoma. Now, when we look at the uh, National Cancer Center guidelines for treatment approaches of newly diagnosed glioblastoma, for those who are younger, which is classified by NCCN as less than age 70, we prefer to consider a clinical trial for these patients, but our standard of therapy includes that brain radiotherapy with concomitant temozolomide, with or without tumor treating fields. And this happens whether they're methylated or unmethylated. When patients are older, we have the option of omitting uh, uh, radiotherapy altogether or going with omitting um, the chemotherapy altogether or going with a hypofractionated chemotherapy because certainly some of the older patients cannot tolerate the combination chemo radiation as well as some of the younger patients. And again, both for methylated and unmethylated patients, uh, tumor treating fields are considered a uh, category one possibility in the treatment. So for the uninitiated, what are tumor treating fields? I remember when I first heard about this when I was back at Cleveland Clinic probably 16, 17 years ago, uh, I was a little stunned to hear that uh, an Israeli scientist thought that we could apply electrical currents to the brain that could seem to stop cell division and specifically work against glioblastoma. So the original trial, the F11 trial, looked at tumor treating fields in uh, recurrent glioblastoma versus standard of uh, best uh, recurrent chemotherapy and seem to have some equipoise. Um, around that time, the basic science of how tumor treating fields was working was also advancing. And it seemed to show that the electrical currents that are applied in alternating fields that travel between the electrodes, either anterior posteriorly uh, or medial laterally and vary every second seem to work on a number of the polar molecules in the brain. So it's just tubulins and septins that are involved in the mitotic spindle attaching to the chromosomes and helping them equally segregate during cell division. When the tumor treating fields are present, it can disrupt that mitosis and either cause cell death via apoptosis or often a cell cycle arrest and blebbing, 
And then it's unclear, but there may be a bit of an immune component by uh, exposure of some neoantigens from the cell during this blebbing that aid the immune response in TT fields. Of course, that's still a little bit um, up in the air at this moment. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about how tumor treating fields work is that the frequency at which the tumor treating fields are best found is inversely related to cell size. So larger cells work at a, when you give a lower frequency tumor treating fields, they inhibit mitosis, whereas smaller cells like small cell uh, lung cancer need a higher frequency of about 240 kilohertz. For glioblastoma, the uh, tumor treating field device delivers 200 kilohertz alternating fields. And as you see, for mesothelioma, the other FDA approval for this device, it's a slightly lower kilohertz at 150 versus 200. So as we had mentioned, tumor treating fields are delivered via a portable battery device and transducer, and they deliver low intensity, about one to three volts per centimeter, intermediate frequency, 200 kilohertz, alternating fields in a couple of different directions. They are applied through the electrodes, which you see on this uh, patient model head, and through the transducer, which you see below. Tumor treating fields are customized per patient. MR data is uh, transmitted through a specialized software which shows where the arrays should be set. Now, many of us, radiation oncologists and neurosurgeons are used to giving gamma knife or other stereotactic radio surgery where moving uh, your collimator a couple of millimeters makes a big difference. But here the electrodes can actually easily be moved a couple of centimeters and because of the longer, relatively longer wavelength of the energy only has a minor impact on where tumor treating fields are delivered in the brain. So the original trial uh, led coincidentally enough by Roger Stoop um, and was published a couple of years ago in JAMA showed a, a schema where after the original six weeks of concomitant temozolomide and radiation therapy, a two to one randomization schema was undertaken to try and deliver tumor treating fields with the device being turned on at least 18 hours a day or 75% of the time until second progression or up to a maximum of 24 months versus uh, six months of vaginant temozolomide. It was stratified by resection status and as well as MGMT status. And in the intent to treat population, it showed an additional survival uh, of a little over uh, four months and moved the median survival from about 16 months to 20.9 months. Now remember, this was the, from the time of randomization, so the time of diagnosis actually pushed median survival on this group out to a little past two years at 24 and a half months. Not unsurprisingly, when subgroup analysis uh, was taken, the methylated group did better with their overall survival at about 31 months versus 17 months. Um, Gross total resection was still better off than partial resection or biopsy, but interestingly enough, uh, the biopsy patients tended to do a little bit better with a lower hazard ratio um, than those um, who were treated versus those who were untreated. The general functional analysis of the patient didn't show any decline in the quality of life. As many patients who treat glioblastoma know, um, the biggest decline we get in quality of life tends to occur from tumor progression near the end of life. And despite having to carry around a two and a half pound battery pack, which actually weighed about four or five pounds back then during that trial, we didn't see much deterioration in the quality of life. And in fact, it stayed pretty, pretty uh, consistent during the entire treatment. So when we really, um, what the paper that was published in Journal of Neuro-Oncology last year looked at was to see if there was any uh, impact of compliance on how patients did. And what we did was try to break down the in a post hoc uh, fashion to look at the EF14 patients, all 695. Of those, we had enough data on compliance to evaluate 450 patients who got tumor treating fields and 229 without, and then broke them into the different deciles of compliance from less than 30% up to greater than 90%. When we really looked at these, we found a, a trend of improved survival, no matter how far we went, um, and that those who wore the device more than 80 to 90 percent and those who wore it greater than 90 percent tended to do much better than those who wore the device uh, only the median. In addition, we found that those who wore the device 
you know, less than 50% of the time probably were not having much impact on their overall survival. Remember that tumor treating fields are an electrical device, so it's either on or off. If the device is off and that cell takes two or three hours to go to, through mitosis while the device is off, it doesn't have the chance to impact that particular cell division. So when we look at the progression-free survival and the overall survival of those in that highest decile, and again, remember, this is a relatively small group of only about 43 patients out of that total of 695 who uh, were involved in the uh, tumor treating fields device and the 450 who were valuable who wore the device. So only about 10% were able to wear it for this long. We did see an increase in both progression-free survival and overall survival that was quite measurable from the uh, median. Um, it increased the overall survival for to by about four months over those who were wearing the device of a median of about 75% of the time from the original trial. And if we map this out, we see a, a fairly interesting phenomena that we've seen in several other pieces of data out there, although primarily in the immunologic data. Um, on the interim analysis, the DC vacs, if we look at the poliovirus data from Duke, both of those studies seem to have a, an interesting tail of about 20 to 30% long-term survivors that fell off early in, this, in the uh, data and then sort of stabilized at about three years. And we didn't have many people fall out from that point. And interestingly here in that group of, of patients who wore more than 90% of the time and um, of tumor treating fields, by year three, they, we didn't see any further declines in survival. So it does suggest you know, that certain possibility, at least, that there may be somewhat of an immune mechanism that's activated during wearing of the tumor treating fields and does pose the possibility that we'll find something further on uh, as we start to evaluate this along with other therapies, such as our immune checkpoint inhibitors, or if we get uh, further progress with some of the um, oncolytic viruses or the dendritic cell vaccines. Now, as one little uh, addition, we also published a, uh, another postdoc analysis of the EF14 data looking at dose density. And this was published in the uh, uh, International Journal of Radiation Oncology and Biology and Physics. And there we started to look at something uh, that we called dose density. We looked for where uh, doing a finite uh, model analysis of where we predicted the electrical currents were running in these patients to try and map out where the voltage was highest uh, and where the dose density was highest. And as we started to divide this between high voltage and low voltage, and here we arbitrarily picked greater than or less than one volt per centimeter uh, or the dose density of one uh, 1.1 milliwatt per centimeter cubed, we could see that there was an increase in survival in both of these when we had higher dose in the areas that were predicted to have tumor. And that included both the T1 weighted with gadolinium as well as the T2 weighted areas of the tumor. And when we uh, really looked at dose density, which was a, a combination of both the power density as well as the patient's compliance, there was a stepwise increase that seemed statistically significant that the more, both the more the patient wore the device and the better the device had high tumor treating field strengths in the areas where we pr would predict there was tumor, we seem to get increased survival as well. This is just a little map of showing where the, the baselines were, where there were high tumor treating fields on a patient with a left uh, temporal occipital GBM. And you notice there was a little fall off in dose uh, anteriorly with the way these electrodes were positioned. And sure enough, when the patient progressed, it seemed to progress in those areas of lower tumor treating fields, um, uh, dose, ten, uh, uh, dose, dose. Um, this is another way to look at that same thing as we do sort of a heat map on the right versus where the progression was on the left. And certainly my own clinical practice, I, I saw this on a number of my patients on the EF14 studies where I'd see sort of out of field progression. Uh, one was you know, an ipsilateral motor strip progression after a right frontal lobe tumor, another after a left parietal temporal tumor progressed by, uh, by frontally in the basal frontal areas. And then when I moved the tumor treating fields up there, we got regression for a while before finally losing her. So I do think this um, does tend to show and overshadow some of the skepticism that people had early with tumor treating fields 
um, if you look at both compliance and where the dose seems to be flowing, that there is a, a dose compliance and response curve here that we shouldn't be seeing if this was all hocus pocus, like I probably thought this was 15 years ago when I first heard about it. So in general, I think we can say that the NCC guidelines do offer tumor treating fields as an option, certainly versus clinical trial or standard of care, whether the patient is methylated or unmethylated, regardless of age. We've seen the tumor treating fields have minimal toxicity and most of those toxicities tend to be dermatologic um, and tend to improve progression-free and overall survival versus the Stroop protocol or standard of care alone. And one of the last things that we've noticed in, in these couple of studies that we put together last year in the post-hoc analysis is that tumor treating field efficacy are influenced positively both by compliance as well as increased dose intensity in the regions of abnormality that correspond to tumor. Um, clearly, there are some obvious engineering things that could be done down the road that may be able to help with compliance and dose density. Um, and I have to say, I've been pleasantly surprised uh, over the last 15 years to see how effective this treatment has been in my patients. I've got a couple of patients who are on study who are past 10 years now still doing well. Um, and uh, pleased to see that at least the science seems to be catching up with what seemed like science fiction when I first heard about this uh, 15 or 18 years ago. So I wanna thank everybody for their attention and hopefully open things up to a few questions here now. Dr. Thompson, thank you so much. Um, fantastic talk, really appreciate your time. Uh, I got, a, I mean, a, a number of questions. I'm, I'm super interested in this and understanding it better and whatnot. Um, my main question is, uh, you know, how does changing position, so how do you guys target exactly, and then how often do you have to change where the electrodes lie, or do they go over the whole head? Um, so in brief, there, there's a proprietary program that the uh, company has that allows you to figure out where best to position. So it's not too dissimilar from making a map for somebody for radiation therapy. You map out where the tumor is, and then this program shows you the optimal position of the electrodes on the scalp to deliver the highest doses around the region of interest that you identify, which is T1 weighted GAD plus the T2 weighted um, areas of tumor. So this is a long, um, relatively long wavelength compared to the energy used in ionizing radiation. So in ionizing radiation, if you move your collimators or if you move your energy source a millimeter or two away, you get vastly, vastly different dosimetry when you lay down your dose. But these wavelengths are long enough and cover so much of the head that the dose drop off from the highest concentration in the head to the lowest concentration is probably somewhere between three and tenfold. So you can actually uh, move the electrodes a couple of centimeter, a centimeter to two in almost any direction without having a major, more than a five or 10% impact on what dose the tumor field, uh, what dose of tumor treating fields you're getting over your region of interest in the brain. And that works out very well for patients because if they get any dermatologic issues, say there's a, um, a titanium plate underneath where one of the electrode, ceramic electrodes is sitting and they're getting a little sore there, they can move the electrode around a little bit without impacting their dosimetry much. Well, what's the largest volume then that you would consider treating with, with one of these? Well, um, you get a, a relatively high dose through most of the supratentorial brain. Um, the way the dose tends to flow is, you know, there's different compliances uh, uh, for the electrical, uh, different electrical impedances throughout the brain. First, the scalp conducts reasonably well, but then you've got this great insulator around your head called the skull. Um, in the center of the head is this big saltwater reservoir. And as most people know, saltwater is a pretty good conductor of electricity. So a lot of the current tends to flow down in and around the ventricles and flows around in that sub, uh, uh, subventricular zone, which if you actually believe that the subventricular zone contains a lot of the more stem-like cells that might be involved in glioblastoma, you might think that's a relatively good thing now. No one's proved either of those hypotheses yet, but at least in my primitive brain, that seems like a relatively good, good thing. Um, so down the road, you could, you could imagine that if we can increase the uh, amount of electricity we can push across the skull, 
or find ways to direct the flow of the electricity a little bit better through the brain, we might be able to get more uniform flow, uh, flow of electricity across the brain. Now, I believe the uh, company has also designed some newer electrodes that go down onto the upper neck a little bit to try and increase um, electrical uh, fields in the posterior fossa. So there's been some interest in looking at these things in cerebellar disease and DIPG and things like that. Um, but I don't have, uh, I haven't seen the data on that as far as how high those fields are versus what they're getting supertentorially. But supertentorially, you'll mostly get anywhere from about, you know, three um, volts per centimeter down to about 0 0.5 volts per centimeter. So it covers most of the supertentorial brain, but about a quarter of the brain or so is at that highest dose, and then it starts to fall off from there. Excellent. We've got two good questions um, from the audience, actually. We've got one question, uh, one participant asked, what are the possible complications from the treatment, um, specifically to healthy uh, non-tumor brain? Right, so, so far this thing does not seem to work very much on any non-dividing cells. And uh, one of the reasons it was first applied to the brain is the brain is primarily post-mitotic. Certainly we've got some stem cells that are making it to the olfactory bulb, some to the hippocampus, and there's a little bit of new neuro, uh, nucleal cells being made, but not a lot of new neurons. So the neurons are quite resistant to these electrical fields. I actually thought the uh, device would start having trouble when they tried to apply it for things like ovarian cancer, where you've got a large amount of fields over the intestines. But if you go back to that slide we showed earlier, um, the uh, intestinal epithelial cells are so large, they are optimized at about 50 kilohertz, whereas I think for ovarian car carcinoma, they're using 150 kilohertz. And that differential means that that um, 150 kilohertz does not impede, impede or impair intestinal cellular mitosis very much. So they haven't had too many side effects. In fact, I had one case that um, went from a normal size glioblastoma to a giant cell glioblastoma when it escaped. And when we moved the treating fields, tumor treating fields over near that area, it really didn't respond very well, probably because of that cell size change that we had. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, another, uh, uh, sorry, another question is, do the treating fields have um, an effect on brain metastases? Obviously, I think we talked about different tumor types responding differently. Right. But has anyone looked at this for brain metastasis? Well, there, there's actually an open trial right now called the METIS trial. It's been relatively hard to enroll and was close to closing down for a while, but I know we've, we've fortunately enrolled four or five patients here in the last few months. Um, and what they're looking at is um, stereotactic radiosurgery alone versus stereotactic radiosurgery plus tumor treating fields for metastases and lung cancer. Um, it'll be curious to see. I, I mean, I certainly... If you look at the way tumor treating fields have worked, there's data, obviously they've been FDA approved for mesothelioma. There's some early data for lung cancer, ovarian, pancreas, uh, and several other uh, tumors. There have been some small trials I know that are investigator mediated for lymphoma and malignant meningioma. So this seems to be a fairly broad uh, mechanism against cancer in general. I haven't seen any of the data from the METIS trial yet, and I don't have enough patients who are farther along in it. And honestly, we do relatively well with gamma knife and yeah. stereotactic radius surgery for brain metastasis. So that's why it's been kind of a hard sell to that group right now. But I'm curious to see if it uh, will reduce the incidence of at least newer metastases coming to the brain and, and becoming evident. Yeah. You know, in light of your compliance uh, talk and the, and the compliance paper, what are you telling your patients now? I mean, how, what are the impediments to compliance and, and how, are, how are you talking to your patients and addressing these? Absolutely. So I, I was going to add, I mean, I think you're, you're really the first to show that there's a, uh, that incremental difference in survival uh, with, with that uh, improved compliance. Uh, so it, it, it really does drive patients, hopefully, to understand and providers to understand uh, the meaningful therapeutic gains that could be achieved, in, uh, you know, as your study would suggest. Well, I got to tell you, Jason, I, I kind of came across the compliance thing by happenstance. Um, we had a, opened the trial when I was at Geisinger, and for those who don't know, Geisinger is in a rural area, middle of Pennsylvania, even more rural than Jason at Charlottesville. So, um, I, I'm, and I'm, we had patients. 
<laughs> You've been there. That's right. You got a brother not too far away. So, um, so we fa- we uh, synchronized our uh, our our patients coming back for their studies so that they got all meet together and meet during our um, uh, our patient uh, wellness and and. Um, uh, gosh, why am I? I'm, bl- I'm aphasic now after surgery, uh, and our and our uh, patient support groups. And what we found is that at the end of the month, every patient gets a little note from the company on their compliance. What percentage of the time did they have their device on? And when all of my patients in the study were meeting each other uh, at, during their monthly meetings, they say, "Hey, Bob, how'd you do on your uh, compliance last week?" Oh, I did 82 percent. Oh, that's pretty good, Bob. You know, I did 94. I don't know if I'll be seeing you next month, but I know I'll be here. And we actually found that, not surprisingly, human beings like to compete. And when we give them data and give them feedback on how they're doing, our patient support groups tended to be the, 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 the best motivator we could have. You and I could tell the patients 100 times that they need to wear it. But when they were getting feedback from their own social network on how they were doing, that I found to be the most important thing. The other part of it, I think, is consistent messaging, um, certainly. One of my early patients on the trial who had a big butterfly glioma um, that I didn't honestly didn't have much hope for, after about nine months, the tumor had gone from a huge butterfly glioma to almost nothing that I could see. But he had an oncologist in upstate New York who kept teasing him about wearing that stupid electrical thing on his head. Um, and he slowed down wearing it and then stopped. And within a matter of months, it came back. So I also found out that, that being on message for the whole treatment team is very important. If there's even one major skeptic out there, you know, that can really undermine the, the patient compliance. And unless and until the whole team is on board with it, it's a hard enough sell because I tell patients that like climbing a mountain, you've got to be committed and you've got to have that village. You've got to have a, you know, have a good Karnofsky really helps and have a good family network of support around you to help with the compliance and getting plugged in and the batteries and goading you to take care of it. But once they get into the routine of doing it all the time of, you know, every two or three days, taking the electrodes off, getting a good shower, shaving the head, putting them back on, plugging in, checking your compliance. um, It can sometimes be hard to get people to stop even when it's not working. And I've had more trouble getting people to stop once they've been on a couple of years and it's clearly not working anymore than I do have with getting them to start. So, so um, what's the battery pack life like? Well, you, you just brought up some of the kind of uh, day-to-day. So uh, the batteries last about two or three hours with uh, normal use. So if you're gonna be out for a day, like I had one who was a uh, computer science professor and he'd bring three or four batteries with him. So you know when he was out lecturing and doing his work and doing office rounds and things, he could swap the batteries in and out. And then when they're back home, they can uh, plug in while they're watching TV and sleeping. So it's a car important. adapter yet or not yet? What's that? Do you have a car adapter yet or not no, yet? I, I, we'd have to ask the company whether they're coming up oh. with one of those yet for those with long commutes in LA and New York, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> sounds a little well, important. I actually bring it up because I wonder, you know, I think with the results that you presented today and, you know, if, if this really does have a major effect like this, then I think as surgeons, we have to always consider why, why don't we implant these electrodes at the initial operation? And, you know, we do this for DBS, a battery runs for eight years, obviously two or three hours is a very different situation. Um, Well, that's going to be the question is, can we get to the point where we're looking at something that's implantable for the patient that can increase their compliance, make compliance easy? And can, and, you know, what's the current drain going to be on the battery? Are we going to be now that Tesla and others are moving our our battery density up. Are we going to be able to get to a battery density that's going to last all day? And then they could put something on their chest to recharge overnight or something like that. Yeah. Um, That would easily improve compliance. And certainly, you know, given the impedance that there is from the bone, we ought to be able to, uh, to use drain less current if we're, you know, epidural or intradural with, with electrodes down the road. Well, the, the data you present and the concept are, 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 are clearly sound. The uh, question I think in, in my mind is where does it go next? And you've touched upon the immune response that could be uh, uh, leveraged. You touched upon compliance issues, engineering issues, and obviously implantable issues. And that's one of the things I was uh, thinking too, Randy, and, and Dr. Thompson is really just we as neurosurgeons, but more broadly as the audience will 
it extends beyond neurosurgeons, uh, you know, are there opportunities to leave something present with the improved technology and battery approach? We're, do, we're looking at something similar with focus ultrasound where you can actually leave burr hole uh, uh, fixated ultrasound emitters and then just access those from time to time to do blood brain barrier disruption in the form of clinical trials and other sorts of things. So I think the sky's at the limit, uh, but I I'm, I'm, uh, must commend you on your work. It's, it's phenomenal and uh, so glad you published it in JNL. Well, thank you for inviting us. As I said, there's a, you and I may not be doing the, uh, you know, our uh, residents will not be doing the same things we were doing of carving out big tumors down the road. Uh, my hope has always been in this field to get far enough down the road that we barely be needed down the road, except for doing biopsies and smaller things and not have to do these huge heroic surgeries we sometimes do. So this is a step, and this is clearly not enough to cure glioblastoma, which is a, a really resistant weed, as you well know. Um, I'm looking forward to you know, the advances that are coming along in the, in the oncolytics and the dendritic cell vaccines, the CAR-Ts. It looks like maybe moving immune checkpoint inhibitors earlier may have an impact. And this may give us a little something else. But if you look at the data here, we know we're, we're making some impacts in our methylated group but we've still got that huge group of 55, 60% who are unmethylated that we really haven't moved the rock very far in the last 15 years. Right. So you and I and the rest of the uh, research community still have a, a lot more work to do. Well, Absolutely. thanks so much. You know, we have uh, Brett Mulvey with us also from Novacure. I don't know if Brett, if you wanted to say a few words as we come to a close, we'd like to limit these to about, you know, 30 minutes or so. So if you want to end it. Sure, sure. And uh, thank you, Dr. Diamico. I appreciate it. Um, so hello, everyone. And thanks for the, the great talk and discussion, Dr. Toms. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to represent Novacure. And, and I'll be very brief, I promise. I know we've, we've already gone over a little bit. So my name is Brett Mulvey. Uh, I'm one of the MSLs with the medical team here. And on behalf of Novacure, I just want to say thank you for allowing us to support this Tumor Talk webinar. Uh, I will mention that Novacure continues to rapidly expand. Uh, and, and develop our, our tumor treat, uh, treating fields therapy. Uh, we now have over a thousand employees worldwide, so expanding quite rapidly. Uh, and in, in addition to our three FDA approved indications, we do have four in our late stage pump pipeline, which Dr. Toms did allude to, to a few of them. Uh, so again, uh, thanks. And we're looking forward to helping support more in the future. And I, I'll just add, just for clarity's sake, uh, I appreciate the, the sponsorship. The sponsorship goes to the Neurosurgical Research and Education Foundation. It is not to the Journal of Neuro-Oncology, uh, but this is a Journal of Neuro-Oncology initiative, Tumor Talk. But your support helps to go to a, a not-for-profit research and educational foundation for neurosurgical uh, uh, trainees predominantly. So that's where the, the sponsorship goes. But thank you so much. And uh, hopefully it'll lead to some more breakthroughs if in uh, TTF or in other things that, that really are moving the needle, I hope, for, for patients with uh, neurosurgical, neuro-oncological processes. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Dr. Tom, thank you. Hey, thank you, everybody. Great Have to see you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye -bye. See you next week.